everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Latinx Kidlit Book Festival. I'm Alex Villasante. I'm an author of Young Adult Stories and one of the co-founders of the festival. And I cannot be more excited for today's feature presentation with Meg Medina. But before I get to that, a couple of quick reminders. Please read our anti-harassment policy in the chat box. This is how we operate in the world and how we want all of our guests and watchers and viewers to operate in the world. Make sure you check that out. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Latinx Kidlet Book Festival's YouTube channel. And if you're a school, classroom, librarian, or educator joining us, please enter our classroom book set giveaway. You can find that link to the entry form in the chat as well. Uh, we, one of the things we love doing at the festival is giving away books. All right, so now to introduce our amazing guests, and I already warned everyone that I'm just gonna be fangirling today, Meg Medina is here in the house. She is an award-winning Pura del Pre and Newbery, to just name a few, New York Times best-selling author who writes picture books, middle grade, young adult fiction. One of my favorite young adult books, Burn Baby Burn, is by Meg Medina. So, so happy to have Meg here. And we also have students from York Academy Regional Charter School in York, Pennsylvania. York Academy is a K through 12 international baccalaureate world school. The students today are from Mr. Chris Hood's seventh and eighth grade language and literature classes. And they're joined by school librarian, Mrs. Kate Daniels. And we are excited to have you guys. And we know that you have had donuts. So we are ready to go. Welcome, Meg. Hello, good morning. Well, for me, it's good morning right now. I'm, I think it's going to be afternoon. It's going to be afternoon. When, yeah. when we're, when we're <laughs> but hi, everybody. And hi, everybody at York. Thanks for coming today. I want Here's one of those the, donuts. I know. <laughs> we should send the authors. I don't know why we don't do that at the festival. We should really send authors donuts. It's. I'll, I'll put it on for next year. I'll talk. I'll okay. talk to Maida and Ismay for next year. So um, we were very excited that we were able to get advanced uh, reader copies of your latest, greatest, uh, Mercy Suarez book. Mercy Suarez plays it cool. Uh, the end of the trilogy, and uh, this is going to be like a book club meeting but with the added awesomeness of being able to uh, ask the author questions that you may have so first question y'all did your homework right y'all read the book yeah all right all right i see okay great so i would love to just kick it off to you meg first if you want to say anything and then we can get to the kids question yeah sure so um so i now have the final book it came out tuesday just um a few days ago in, in early September. And um, it was a hard book for me to write because I knew that this was going to be the last time that I could sit really <clears throat> with the Suarez family. And the other thing is that because when I wrote the book, I wasn't, when I wrote the first novel, Medici Suarez Changes Gears, I wasn't thinking that I was writing a series. Mm -hmm. So each book that got added, I had to do a lot of, uh, remembering of what I had said in the first book, making sure that the street name was the same or the teacher name was the same or like keeping track of all the things that normally when you're writing a series, you keep track of. But the biggest thing I kept asking myself was, um, how am I going to tie all the storylines together and bring it in for a landing that feels realistic and that feels true to what her experience has been. So, you know, it was a journey trying to figure out friends, especially Edna, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> there's just like- Frenemy. Ed, yeah, it, it, and we all have an Edna, you know, mm -hmm. we typically meet or we are Edna, right? One of one of the two things happen. Um, Lolo, mm -hmm. uh, and, and mm -hmm. just like all the things that when we start hitting eighth grade, like we come into middle school in one um, sort of mindset, younger mindset. But by the time we leave middle school and we're getting ready for high school, we're already thinking of other things, right? Romantic things, or, you know, what, who we want to be, all of that kind of stuff. So like how to cover all of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, I'm interested to see what the kids at York think of whether I landed that okay and, and really what kind of questions they had. I had, you know, it was, as with all the books, 
I write and unwrite and rewrite and I love the book and I hate the book and I can't write the book and I give up on the book and I come back to the book. And that's, that's what writing looks like for me generally. Yeah. I mean, you make it look so easy. <laughs> oh I know, boy. I know it's not easy, but you, you make it look effortless. It's just, it's just a joy to read your words. Okay. So uh, enough fangirling from me. So um, what, uh, what, who wants to start with questions? Do we want to start with Cole? I think Cole had a question. I know I just picked on you, Cole. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask, why did you choose the name Mercy? Oh yeah. So names are kind of interesting, right? Like when some authors, like they can't write, I think I wrote, I think it's Ursula Le Guin, the fantasy writer. Like she couldn't write a word of her novels until she had all the names of the places and exactly the map drawn and so on. Like she couldn't write a word of the novel. So for me, it's, I have written characters where I've changed the name midway, where I'm like, nah, this doesn't feel right for the character. But with Mercedes, Mercy, I liked a couple of aspects. So Mercedes to have, in English, to have mercy with a Y for someone is to have great sympathy, right? Is to to behave, to offer them like a, a love and a grace, right? That that holds them up. Mercedes, right, is, is the Spanish of that. And so girls who are called Mercedes in Spanish are often called Merci, right, as a nickname. And so it worked, I thought, in both a Spanish and an English setting, like you could relate to that name and what it held in mm -hmm. her uh, pretty well. I did this, you know, I've done it in other novels. I have a character in another novel called Piedad Sanchez and, and um, you know, and they call her Pity. Rolando is called Roli. You Roli. know, I try mm -hmm. to use the nicknames that that are very common in, in our culture, you know, like, I had, you know, cousins named Nana and Fach, but you know, Papo and Pancho and you know, like all things like Tato. that. We have a primo right, Tato. Tato, like these <laughs> these names that that have nothing to do with like what their real name is. You know, their real names are serious, you know, names, but they get uh, they get these nicknames. So I wanted to honor that as well. It's amazing how well uh, that Mercy's name suits her. Uh, mm. it, it's just, it just, I don't know if it's because I've come to know her and love her or what, but it's just, I couldn't imagine her having another name. So I think that that is <laughs> uh, just a testament. So, yeah. So, all right. So, uh, what, who else has a question? You can raise your hand or just talk too. Oh, you don't want me picking on you. Oh, Jane, go for it. Yes. Um, what inspired you to be an author? Um, you know, that's such an interesting question. I think as, as kids, we, you just have stuff you like to do, right? Like just think of yourself in your own life. Like your teacher assigns a particular kind of thing. Maybe for you, it's something in science, right? They like, we're going to be building robots. And, and there's always that kid in class who's like, oh, yes, I've been waiting. <laughs> and then the other one whose head goes on the desk and says, kill me now, you know, like, so we all have like the things we're drawn to. So as a kid, I was really drawn to writing stories, to telling stories. I know you can't believe this, but to talking too much, right, in <laughs> class. And, um, and my family also told a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that when they came from Cuba, their, their country was in a massive sort of civil unrest that led to a big change in government, right? It, um, it went from a democracy to a, um, communism. And so a lot of people were leaving at that time, my family among them. And it was really traumatic. They left their families, their homes. They were in a new country. They didn't speak the language. Like none of the jobs that they had known and knew how to do in their old country they could do here so they took jobs that whatever they could so it was just a really traumatic time and i think my family to cope with that sort of sadness did a lot of storytelling and so they told me like you know i of course i heard the oral versions of caperucita roja 
Little Red Riding Hood and all of those kinds of stories. But I also heard the story of the hurricane of 1933 that wiped out my grandmother's village, you know, the the great affair that happened between so-and-so and so-and-so in Sao La Grande. And, you know, like these completely inappropriate stories, but stories, stories, <laughs> stories. And what was great about it is is that it connected me to my family's past, to my culture, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond being a girl in Queens growing up here, which is also part of me. But there's this other part that began in Cuba and that began with loss and that began in with a community of great love and so on. Mm -hmm. So it connected me to that and it gave me an ear for storytelling. And you know how it is. My grandmother was the best one. She she really could tell a story with drama. And so you learn when to pause, what detail to say. I'll let you know about that in just a second. And you know, like and like she was the like cliffhanger, the master the cliffhanger. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you could do it in oral storytelling. So all those things together conspired to make me, I think, just sort of like story. It was a natural thing. And then you know, becoming a writer was much later a choice. And for me, actually, believe it or not, a hard choice. It was something that in my heart I really wanted to do, but it was something that my brain and ironically my family and, and people I knew said was impossible for me to do, mm. right? We didn't know who knew a writer, right? I, mm -hmm. I knew nobody in publishing like it just and also a career in writing seemed risky. It wasn't, you know, as um, as a sure thing as like an office job of, of some kind. And mm -hmm. so my mom did not want me to suffer a hardship of any kind. So she wanted me to have that office job. So, you know, the problem is what happens is, though, when you have something that you want to do, and that you're good at, and maybe even that you're meant to do, it actually is very hard not to do it. Because you will do other jobs that you're good at, but you won't be happy. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I found. So eventually, I said, okay, I'm going to quit this job that I'm good at, but don't like, and I'm going to really try to write a novel. And, and then, then it was like Cinderella with the right shoe. Right? <laughs> it was just like, this is it, you know, and it's a hard business. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. It's, a, it's not an easy way to make a living, but it is the right way for me to do it. So that's such a long answer. I love that answer. I love that answer because I, it connects to all of us. We're like storytelling animals. That's what we do. And yeah. when it comes from our families, it's even more precious because we get these insights to if my parents are also immigrants to like what it was like in another country and at another time with other people and your abuelos and bisabuelos. And so I, I love that. But I, I actually think kids today are also very into the whole storytelling thing. Even TikTok is a way to tell a story you know it's a different way but it's a way to, i don't know if you guys uh, are on tiktok or watch tiktok videos endlessly like my children probably i feel like maybe piper does i don't know she's got a tiktok kind of face to me but uh that's a way of telling stories too you know so i think that when you think about how you tell stories and how meg tells stories it's not so far apart all right so uh who else has a question i have a question okay yeah how does having Cuban parents influence your story? Oh. Yeah, so, you know, hmm, I don't, I think that the stories that you write ultimately come from whatever is inside of you, right? And so even when you're writing fiction, you are, which is, you know, all the things that you make up theoretically, right? You're basing it on something. You're basing it on usually how the things you're wondering about in the world, the things that you ha are figuring out or have figured out, the things you feel like a passionate, you have a passionate opinion about, right? And so um, 
you know, my family, the in Medici's family, you know, it's a very warm and loving family. They're imperfect for sure, right? Abuela's got her neuroses and, you know, Lolo Dill and Roli is, you know, perfection. It's like everybody's got their thing. My family had lots of imperfection. Like part of it, I think, was, you know, the sadness that mm -hmm. followed them from Cuba here led to a lot of depression, right? And, and things mm -hmm. like that. So there were lots of difficult things, moments in, in my growing up. There were lots of moments where I couldn't get along, let's say with my mother or when I was embarrassed by my mother's accent or by our poverty or things like that. There were angry moments in, in the family. There were all of those things. Um, and there was growing up, right? Which is hard as you know and are figuring out, right? One day you loved yourself, the next day you hate yourself. One day you're on top of the world, the next you're like so confused by things. So when you mix all that together, right? You get the soup that is growing up. That, um, I don't know, that way of growing up through the Cuban lens and through all of that push and pull in family, that's what I'm pull that's what I use as like the the material for what I write. So and and you never know what I'm gonna pull out. Like the for example, we were talking earlier about some of the food in Medici Suarez, right? Then she has a dog cruncher, right? This hot dog. This hot dog. Gosh, if that were the bell for me at school, I you would never fall asleep. You would never fall asleep at your desk, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that the hot dog, you know, that she sells at the school store or whatever, the dog cruncher uh, in one of the books. So I, I was talking to a lady one time who said her Girl Scout project, she and her friend had designed this hot dog that they split down the middle and put mashed potatoes in and they called it whatever. And, and I don't know why I remember that or why that stayed with me, but I grabbed that. And the abuelas, uh, abuela in, in the book, are my two grandmothers merged together, a seamstress and someone who's terrified of every possible way that you could die, right? And I merged them together to give us abuela. Um, you know, some things are very close to who people were and some are very different. You know, my mother was not a physical therapist, for example. But I thought it was important to have a variety of jobs that her parents did. Because sometimes when we write about books about Latino families, we write just strictly one kind of job or one mm -hmm. kind of experience. So I wanted to make sure that people could see a family that had all kinds of folks and so on. So I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's not a direct line. It's everything you write has to do with your parents, with your brothers and sisters, with the weird things you remember from growing up, mm -hmm. you know, stuff I, like that. And the weird things you remember from other conversations. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think that you improved on the dog cruncher because mashed potatoes would not have worked for me, but the potato chips absolutely work. It makes sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who else has got a question? Nicole. Um, Nicole. Do you have any experience with soccer? Do I have any experience with soccer? Yes. Standing on the sidelines yelling for my daughter, Sandra, go pass it! Like that. <laughs> I, okay, so I am old enough that I can tell you that um, th I was not a sports person in high school or, or junior high school. I had so much energy, uh, you couldn't keep me still, but I never you know, attempted a sport or anything like that. As a little kid, I danced. And then I just, I think ran around and made people crazy is probably how <laughs> I expended my energy. Is that a sport? That should be a sport. I think so, it's a sport. I think some of these okay. kids maybe are really good at that sport. I have a yeah. feeling. <laughs> Cole but, is very good at the sport. <laughs> yeah. But then, but then when I was writing this, <clears throat> I've always loved sporty kids, right? Sporty, sporty girls. Um, and Watching Sandra play, this is the daughter who's going to get married next week, but when Sandra was younger and watching her play, it was kind of amazing to see how a team forms, right? 
who emerges as the leader what happens when somebody messes up what what the coach is like like and what the team is like depending on the different coaches right that you have mm. um what matters and i love um i love watching them think on their feet and work together to make like something successful happen and then the other thing that is hard is when there's like a bitter defeat, right? Like that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Also, in in some way, an important skill to be able to work hard, not get what you want, and pick yourself up and try again. So there were all, and and then all the health things that, that come with sports. So I mean, I love it. I'm I'm I still watch it now. My favorite is watching. Um, the American uh, women's team, um, they're a little less dramatic than all the other male teams. Who, like when they're hurt, they throw themselves down. They do the big thing. Like the women, like you bash them and they're like, bring it. You know, like I, yeah. I love that. So, so true. I don't know. <laughs> it is true. It is true. Just watch the, you know, watch the World Cup when it comes. But anyway, it's, uh, I, I do love, I do love that she played soccer, but I have to say, I had to do a lot of research on soccer and I had to talk to Santa's old coach and talk to her and watch a lot of soccer, just to um, a lot of soccer videos on footwork from the first novel to the second novel to the third novel, just as she was getting better. I think in the second novel, when um, you know she's playing with her dad's team and so on, that was the one where I most had to learn about what I was talking about. I think so research. many people don't realize how much research there is in books. And, and when yeah. authors do research, we research everything. And then maybe a tiny little piece of it gets into the book. But at least then we feel that yeah. we can speak on this thing and, and be truthful about it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so sure. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole, do you play soccer? No. <laughs> You just, no. just have, yeah, just I understand. <laughs> Don't let that stop you from writing about it. <laughs> yes, ex good point. <laughs> you can write about anything. All right, any other questions we have from Piper? Yeah. What made you want to put Spanish in your dialogue? What made me use Spanish in the dialogue? Yeah. I think that that's really, really how um, bilingual kids sort of operate. And mm -hmm. so, um, sometimes people who speak mostly one language or only one language think that when another language you know when you're using another language that you're translating right yeah. it's not exactly like that for bilingual people bilingual people just have more words in their mind for the same thing so i have cup itasa right i have both of those things exist in my brain and sometimes I call it one and sometimes I call it the other, but they're sort of always in play in there. And so when I talked with my mom and my aunt or even here with Javier, I, I'll start something in English and then I move to Spanish. I, there are certain phrases that I only know in Spanish and that are perfect, you know? Um, and I think it adds an authenticity, meaning what's on the page really looks like how people behave and how people are so the tricky part of that is also being respectful and mindful that there are readers who are coming to the page who don't have both languages right and so how do we make it understood to them as they're reading and you'll have to tell me if i was successful or not the strategy that I try to use, because I don't like glossaries, I don't like any of that, but the strategy that I try to use is that there's enough context clues around the phrase and so on that you can read it and get the idea and keep going without too much trouble. And then the plus is that you can ask one of your Latino friends, hey, what did this mean? And and they could probably tell you. Um, so. Yeah, that, that's how I do it. I think I love celebrating um, different languages and different ways of expression and different ways of knowing the world um, in a single book. And I, and I think that's especially important for Latino kids to see that their language has value, that their language isn't something they have to 
um, forget and only speak English and, and those kind of things. They, that we are allowed to be many things as a person. Oh, I love your explanation, Meg, of, of bilingual kids uh, having just more words. And then it's sort of like what word comes to you, that's the one you use, because that's definitely been my experience as well for some reason. And when you were saying cup or tasa, and I was like, sometimes I slip up and call it a vaso. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. you know, a drinking thing, a thing you drink with. Jane, right. do you, I have a question for you. Do you speak another language? Me? Jane. Yeah. Do you speak another language? No. I'm, I'm asking because what was your experience, all of your experience, when you did come up against the Spanish in uh, the book? What, what did you think? And, and did it make you wonder about it? Or what was your experience? Um, for me, so at York Academy, we take Spanish from kindergarten to 12th grade, I think. So yeah. I knew some of it, and then I just used the context clues for the rest. Yeah. It's a good skill. Listen, when you get, especially you guys in, in your program, you know, sometimes it, it's a, applicable to any um, subject. Like, let's say you're in science class and you have some big, ginormous word they throw at you, right? And you, you don't know what it is. You've got to figure it out from mm -hmm. what's around there, right? So, I don't know. I think it's an important reading skill, being able mm -hmm. to confront something that you can't immediately unpack and and find assistance in the text to help you unpack it. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well that means that you did a good job. See Meg, you did you did it. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Um okay, who else got a question? Um I have one more. What is it like to win awards like the Newberry Medal for your range? Yeah, well, exciting for sure. Um you know, it's a the Newberry's a very uh, it's a very big deal in the in the world of children's literature, right? And so, before I won the Pudavel Prey, I had won uh, uh, not not Pudavel Prey, the Newberry. Before I had won the Newberry, I had won the Pudavel Prey um, award. And if you don't know that one, that is a wonderful award named for a librarian named Pudavel Prey who was an Afro-Puerto Rican librarian during the Harlem Renaissance, like in the 1920s in New York City. She was working with a, a group really of really groundbreaking librarians at a time when they were just starting children's programs in public libraries, right? Prior to that, nobody wanted to let them in because they thought they had dirty fingers and wouldn't be nice to books. But um, Buddha really looked at out at her community and saw that the books that were on the shelves and the collections available weren't reflecting the kids who were in the um coming to the programs and who lived in the neighborhood so anyway there's an award named for her and i won that award and the award celebrates a latino uh, author whose whose work celebrates latino culture so and there have been other beautiful things so what happens though is What's different about the Newberry is that I won all those other awards, but you know, you had to really know children's literature really well to know me or have heard of me or whatever. But then you win the Newberry and all that changes, right? And then suddenly you have a lot, a, a big profile and people know your work and are interested and things like that. The good news, like that feels very nice for sure. But that's not a lasting thing, right? Having people make a fuss of you is not a lasting thing. What's a lasting thing is what you do with it, right? So when you win an award like that, I, what I like to do, and maybe you're going to win awards in your own lives, right? Like a good question to ask is, okay, so I have achieved this, and what do I do with this? Like what, how do I return this in, in, in to the community, to the, to the spirit of children's literature. Like, what do I do with this position now? And so it's given me a lot of chance to talk and introduce other Latino authors to, to folks, to promote bilingualism, to, to make it okay to use Spanish and English in the same sentence in books and so on. Um, I talk a lot in different places about the need to really let kids re have the freedom to select and read the books they want to read. So, you know, it just gave me what we, some people call it platform, but what that, you know, that just means it gives you a bigger 
megaphone to be able to um, reach people and talk about things that you think are, are important. So that's what it was. I mean, it's fun. There's on my website, if you want to see it, there's the, I think I have the call when they called me to tell me that I won the Newberry. And it's ridiculous because I kept saying no, right? Because I just <laughs> couldn't believe it. It was ridiculous. I had just gotten out of the shower from the, I had come back from the YMCA and here they are calling me with, and I thought like, are you kidding? Like it just, it wasn't, it did not, it took a second for it to, to come together. And then there was a lot of blubbery crying and all those things. But um, it, it's been wonderful. And so the other thing that you could check out is that um, when you win the Newberry, they ask you to do a speech. And you do the speech to all the big librarians in the country at this big annual meeting called the ALA meeting. And you're there with all your publishing friends and thousands of librarians and your heart is beating out of your chest and you get 20 minutes to talk to them about this metal and and its impact or, or something you want to say. So that speech is on somewhere on in <laughs> on YouTube or, and it's certainly on my um, on my website. And I talk about just what you're asking. Um, and I talk about bicycles a lot in that <laughs> one also, but mostly about um, you know growing up and how stories shape, how growing up shapes the stories you tell really, and how the stories you tell sort of shape how you continue to grow and evolve as a person, even as an adult person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you can check check that out. Are any of you guys writers? Do you, do you enjoy writing yourself? Cole is shaking his head. I feel like Cole is not not so, Cole is your Cole like, is your robot you can kid. say no. <laughs> Cole, Cole is your robot kid. Like I think that's your robot kid. Where if you're like we're gonna make a role about Cole's like me. No, am I wrong about that, Cole? Are you a science guy? <laughs> okay, so okay. I have science, and that's okay. That my daughter was a big writer, and she ended up being um, a nurse. You know, she mm -hmm. she works in sciences. So, like you can be many things. There's lots mm -hmm. of things inside of us, but um, uh, yeah. Anybody else a writer? Anybody? It's hard to admit that you're a writer with Meg Medina, I feel like. You know? <laughs> hey, why? Well, well, because, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would have. Does it make you nervous? Because I have to say, like, every time I come to the page, I come to the page with the same panic you guys come to the page. Like, that little cursor blinking, and you don't know what to write, and you're like, ah right i have this uh, the same thing the only difference is that i have i have been in that panic zone before so i i know that i will come out of it on the other side but for sure um every book is new every book is a new chance to learn to be a writer mm -hmm. and that's that's really and truly what happens like right now i'm working on a fantasy right mm -hmm. and I haven't written fantasy in many, 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 many years. And I'm sort of reacquainting myself with that whole process. And I can't tell you the number of days that I get myself somewhere and I go, what am I gonna do with this ghost? I don't know what to do. I hate this ghost. <laughs> and like, I get rid of the ghost. And then I come back and I put something up. And I know that's doomed. And I, it's like that, it's like that. But somehow in all of that, a book keeps getting shaped. Uh, it's, a, it's a messy process but it's, mm -hmm. it's how it happens, really. That's so fun. And now I'm super excited about your next book. <laughs> I have a question for them about mm -hmm. the characters. Like, so I spent a lot of time in this novel really thinking about friend groups um, in, in middle grade and middle school, like how we belong to one group and shifting to another. And I didn't know if that felt realistic as, as you were reading it that you, did you feel like, oh, I know people like this, or I've had this situation? Like, did that feel relatable to you? I guess is is my question. Yeah. 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 I it's hard. A lot of nodding happening. Very. Yeah. Anyone want to elaborate? The friend groups. Did it feel real? I'm shy. Yeah. Journey's no, like I'm... too real. Too real. <laughs> well. You know, it is hard. I mean, I think, you know, 
struggles with friends is hard, especially like when you when you're all trying to agree on something, right? And somebody disagrees or wants to go off and do something slightly different. Or if you're more if you're part of more than one group, mm -hmm. which is totally okay, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to manage, right? If it, it, ah, I felt for mercy every time I was writing those scenes, you know, because she is trying to figure out how all those pieces fit together. Even Edna, who is just such a trial to her. You know, and has been for years, you know? Yeah. I yeah. feel like when I hear, I have a, a child who is in um, middle school, and when I hear from her about, you know, get together, and I'm like, well, so is so-and-so going to be there? And they're like, oh, no, that's my drama group, like my drama school group. And I'm like, you have different groups? How many friends do you have? A lot of friends, and they all have different interests and sometimes they don't necessarily get along and and you might feel like you're in the middle a little bit right yeah i'll tell you the kid who i've always liked in this series interestingly i mean i like all of them wilson's terrific you know they're they're all wonderful in one way or the other i've always been really fond of lena hmm. um i just feel like she marches to her own beat and she's reasonable she's um and there's a line in one of the novels where where Mercy first thinks of Lena as a friend and not just sort of this background girl who's always got a book in her hand. And she said, you know, she's the only person I know who can be alone and doesn't look lonely. Mm. And so, like, I love that notion of this girl who's just sort of um, pretty comfortable in who she is. I've always mm -hmm. admired that about her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. you end up with different favorite characters in your in your book aside from the main character you know I also like Miss McDaniel's oh you know she's so persnickety about it well so is 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 she the most interest like fun to write because I know sometimes your your main your favorite character might not be the, the the nicest character but they might be the most fun to write she is because she's so smart and on top of things and so impossible to please and persnickety <laughs> and her rules are nutty you know what i'm saying she's got a rule for everything like there's always one of those in a school right mm -hmm. york i mean there's always one. like <laughs> no, there's always no. these i do you don't have to say it but it's the truth <laughs> you know the one who knows all the rules wants you to follow all the rules very proper that kind of thing and so um i I don't know, she was fun to write, but they're all sort of fun to write. Like it's fun to write. It was fun in this one. You know, Edna is just drives me crazy. So when I draw when I draw her and I write her lines and so on, it's really fun to channel her, right? Her 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 snottiness sometimes, her her borderline, she's struggling to control her wildly inappropriate bullying <laughs> instincts right she's trying to rein it in you know mm. but what's been fun what was fun about writing edna is writing a girl who's trying to become self-aware mm -hmm. of herself right so we're all imperfect right and we're all trying to work out the kinks in our personalities and we're at in middle school for sure we keep trying on different personalities Right, trying mm -hmm. to find the one that sort of feels right, which is, I think, what makes us feel a little lost sometimes in that in that time. Mm -hmm. But it, it was interesting to me in this one, you know, watching Edna struggle to be better, you know, to sort of acknowledge that she is, you know, can be really a pain to people, and mm -hmm. figuring out how to change that. And, you know, many years ago, I was a teacher and I always had kids who sometimes the most the, the ones who wanted to be the funny one in, in class and always had a joke or things like that. But they'd sometimes like take it too far or injure mm. somebody with their words or crack the class up at somebody's expense, that kind of thing. And, you know, helping that kid be better, you know, helping that kid figure out how to use charisma in a different way than than to just lift themselves at somebody else's expense. You know, it's yeah. just, yeah.
lot of lots of ins and outs about that. So much going on in middle in middle grade and middle school. So, uh, what other questions do you all have about about writing or about mercy or anything at all? I feel like we haven't heard from. Have we heard from everybody? Yeah. Okay. So now you're done, and you. Uh, it's because of the donuts. You're all in a food coma. I think that's what's <laughs> happened. Because I have tons of questions. <laughs> oh. But no, I want to hear. I want to hear from from all of you. What other questions do you have? All right. Well, I'm going to ask a question, and then maybe you guys can uh, hop in with any thoughts you have about this. Because uh, reading this book. I definitely had that feeling of, of what happens when we start to lose our elders, our abuelos, our grands, our grandpas, like that feeling that often happens at this at this age. Um, what was one of the things, Meg, that you were what, that you wanted to do, but you also were maybe a little, um, you know, not hesitant, but like wanted to be mindful of? Yeah. So here's something, you know, the early on in the book it's like the second chapter i think lolo has that episode the first time mm -hmm. and they rush him to the hospital the first time i wrote that scene lolo dies mm -hmm. in that scene and the book was going to start at his death mm -hmm. oh man oh that was hard i just i loved lolo having mm -hmm. just yeah it was very hard to do. And then I kept thinking, if I start the book there, then the book is only about her grief because it's going to be all encompassing because when we're, when something sad like that happens, it's just massive, right? Mm -hmm. It's massive. It's all you can mm -hmm. think of. So I decided that it would probably be more fair to the reader <clears throat> and maybe softer for me to use it as sort of like a foreshadowing right? You've probably heard that mm -hmm. word in language arts class, right? Sort of um, an idea that suggests what is to come. And so it prepares the reader subtly, sort of in the back of their mind, that he really has, is getting more and more frail um, mm -hmm. and more and more impacted by, by his illness. So, um, you know, th there was there was that, that this notion of um, writing grief was was a little scary for me. So I found so many great resources. There's a podcast called Grief Out Loud. It's out of California. And I, they had, and it's not only for kids, it's grief, like you, you will grieve all time. Like my mom died in 2013 and I grieved and my mom was in her eighties, you know? So I think, you could you will know grief at all different points in your life and it won't necessarily be easier at one point or another so anyway this podcast has lots of, it sounds like it would be a real downer but it was really <laughs> a hopeful thing right mm -hmm. it was people um talking and um saying the things that sometimes are hard to say because you feel so lonely when you're in grief um and so that was really helpful. And I did a lot of research on guidance counselors and how schools help kids who are in grief because kids who grieve, it's a little different. Like they're not sad 24 mm seven -hmm. because you are 12 or 13. So you have a, you're laughing hysterically with your friends. You're really sad. You're really, and it's like this up and down thing. Um, and, and how good schools and good guidance counselors can step in and help families sort of wrap their um, head and hearts around each other, you know, when things like this happen. And then, you know, there's the grief, I think, that happens in schools and in communities all over the place now with violent acts and so on. And we have to help kids know the language of sadness and how to work through it, because it's going to come back somehow anyway mm -hmm. it comes back in their grades it comes back in their behavior it comes back in lots of of yeah. unexpected ways so yeah yeah it's a part of life and it's one of the beautiful things about this book that and, and a lot of other books that uh sort of talk about grief and and people dying or moving you know what 
I, I feel like it's important for kids who maybe have an experience to understand that this is a normal part of life and it is something that happens to everyone. Um, even though it made me sad to read about it because I care about Lolo and, and all of the Suarez family so much, but it's, it's, it's important to, to get that message out there. Do, do you, do any of you kids have any feelings about that? Was it hard to read? Was it something that you, I, I mean, I think Meg did a great job of that foreshadowing where you knew that that was something that was entering into Mercy's life. What do you think? Cole, yeah. I didn't really like reading that part of the book. I was like, I had to put it down for a little bit and then pick it back up and like finish it off. But then after that, I kind of like, I just think that was kind of like a good ending to like the trilogy. Yeah. I had to put it down when I was writing it too, if it, if it helps you to know that at all. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, when you have to write something really awful that's gonna happen to your character, you're so attached to the character that, that it hurts you to do it, right? It hurts you to watch yeah. them go through it. But you know, what I like, if I may say so myself, what I like about the novel is that it is it is for sure a look at, at how we process grief. It's also about a first kiss. It's also about mm -hmm. mending friendships. It's also about figuring out how to manage friendships and the different categories and levels of friendship. And it's, it's about like growing legs under you and figuring out how to lead in the sixth grade, in the first novel, Medicine really didn't know how to lead. But I think by this, by this novel, by the end of it, she's figured out how to be herself and, and use that as, as the way that she propels herself. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I hope, I hope uh, readers will feel like it all came in for a good landing and that you got to see her grow up and then it just feels like something that that makes you think about how you're growing up and the things that you guys sort of see and process all the time. And mm -hmm. I, I'm looking in the chat over here that we are, oh my goodness, running yes, out of time. We are. Alex, yes, I know. Happen? We could do this all day. I could do this all day. Um, but I do <laughs> want to say we have time for one more question. And um, if, I mean, I literally have a list of like 17 questions. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always prepared for a question for Meg, but does anyone, do, do you guys have any questions that you want to ask Meg? This will be the last question. Yeah, Piper. Uh, do you ever write more than one book at a time? Mm. Yes, yes, I didn't used to. I used to only be able to do one story at a time, but now I have no choice. I don't like to do it because when I get into the world of a book, I get completely immersed in it. But um, I had to, for example, I just finished writing the manuscript for a little book about Pura Belpirek, right? It's a chapter book at the same time that I'm writing this fantasy and at the same time that I was doing edits on this. So, yeah, you as as <laughs> as your career moves on, things heat up, you know, uh, but I if it were my preference, I would only write one book at a time. But I know lots of authors who write multiple things. I'm just. I don't prefer to do it. I only do it if I have to. And does it Thank make it easier, Meg, that you um, are writing different kinds of books at the same time? Uh, I don't know. I I just don't, I don't like the interruption. That's what it feels mm. like. Like when I have to think of an, in another way or about another set of characters or situations, I feel like it interrupts the flow of the other book that I'm working on. So I don't transition well. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think between projects, but I have no choice. I'm learning just like I'm learning to, to do a, a little bit more plot outlines than I used to do. I used to never do them. And now I realize that sometimes you need a few, few plot points to follow. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still learning that. <laughs> yeah. I'm still learning yeah. about plots. And we'll, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that offline. Yes. Well, we are amazingly out of time. I can't believe it because it seems like 10 minutes have gone by, but actually we are at the end of time. I want to thank you, Meg Medina, for this incredible, incredible conversation. I want to thank the kids at York Academy in York, yes. Pennsylvania for getting up early, eating donuts, 
reading the book, having awesome questions. Um, and I also want to just thank all of you who are watching for attending the Meg Medina Plays It Cool feature presentation at the Latinx Kidlit Book Festival. And just muchísimas gracias. And we'll see you next time. You can all wave. Have a, have a good day at school, guys. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. I'm Judith from Penguin Young Readers. And today I'm here with Danielle Presley. Hi, everyone. To share some of our favorite books by Latinx and Hispanic creators. We have a lot of exciting titles to share with you, some that are available now and some publishing next spring. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. All right, so we're gonna start off strong with our HQ graphic novel series. Um, this is a series that I am so excited about. The Kid Tested Biography series, Who Was Line, is now available as graphic novels, and this installment focuses on Mexican-American labor leader and civil rights activist, Cesar Chavez. This is a story of hope, solidarity, and perseverance that will invite readers to immerse themselves in this pivotal point in history, brought to life by a gripping narrative and vivid full color illustrations that jump off the page. So we are so thrilled to share the companion to the New York Times bestselling The Day You Begin, The Year We Learned to Fly, written by Jacqueline Woodson and illustrated by Rafael Lopez, and the Spanish edition simultaneously pubbed and is available. So in this beautiful book, a brother and sister use techniques taught to them by their grandmother to use their imaginations to help them manage so many different things in their life, boredom, anger, and frustration. She calls it learning to fly. And if this imagery reminds you of the book by Virginia Hamilton, they um, called The People Could Fly, that's intentional. In Virginia Hamilton's book of American Black Folk Tales, she tells the story of how enslaved people escaped their hard lives by lifting up and flying away from home. Jacqueline Woodson uses the same imagery to remind the brother and sister in this book of the power of these passed down stories. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor has been called the people's justice and takes her role as an inspirational figure seriously. She has always done her part to build a better world and a better community through medicine, law, and children's literature. Just Ask was a favorite among our educators, and now you'll have another book to add to your collection with Just Help. Uh, Justice Sotomayor takes young readers on a journey through a neighborhood where friends and strangers all help one another to build a better world for themselves and their community. With art by award-winning illustrator Angela Dominguez, these, uh, this meaningful story shows how we can make the world better one action at a time by asking the question, who will you help today? Jenny Torres Sanchez is the author of multiple YA novels, inc including the Pura Bell Prey honor, We Are Not From Here. And now the youngest readers will get to experience her beautiful and lush writing in her debut picture book, With Lots of Love. This lyrical story about a girl who moves from her home in Central America to the US, leaving everything behind, including her abuela, celebrates the special bonds of multi-generational love. With families experiencing more physical distance, now more than ever before, and given the immigration of Latinx individuals and the separation many are facing at the US-Mexico border, this story touches on the very real notion that love exists beyond borders. Diamond Park is a book that you won't be able to stop thinking or talking about. In short, it's about four Mexican-American teenagers from Houston, a 59 Chevy Impala, and a murder that changes their lives forever. Grappling with the themes of identity and gender, this book is perfect for readers of Matt de la Peña and Randy, Ru Randy Rube's Painted Saints of Nothing. The writer, Philippe, is the son of Haitian ex exiles and grew up in Mexico City. He's a recipient of the of the Penn slash Phyllis Naylor Working Writer Fellowship, that's a long one, and author of two previ previous novels, including the acclaimed YA novel, Playing for the Devil's Fire, which is Yalso's best fiction for young adults pick, another long one. I hope you all get to read this one. We are so excited to welcome Margarita Engel um, to our list. Singing with Elephants is a beautiful historical fiction novel in verse focusing on one girl and her quest to save a baby elephant in need. Cuban born 11 year old Oriole lives in Santa Barbara, California where she struggles to belong. But most of the time that's okay because she enjoys helping her parents care for the many injured animals at their veterinary clinic. Then Gabriela Mistral, the first Latin American winner of the Nobel prize in literature moves to town. 
an aspiring writer, Oriol, finds herself opening up. As she begins to create a world of words for herself, Oriol learns to take, um, to take courage to, uh, well, learns it will take courage to stay true to herself and do what she thinks is right, attempting to rescue a baby elephant in need, even if that means keeping secrets from those she loves. This is such a gorgeous story, um, story of friendship, standing up for those who don't have a voice and how poetry can be such a meaningful form of expression. This was a big year for us with two picture books from Jacqueline Woodson on our list. In The World Belonged to Us, she teams up with the magnificent and award-winning illustrator, Leo Espinoza. Um, this book celebrates the joy and freedom of summer in the city. It's both nostalgic and timely. It also celebrates children's budding independence, models leadership skills, and captures the sense of community in a diverse city neighborhood. The art is lively and free-spirited, and the text is evocative and rhythmic. This is bound to be one of the most celebrated, stocked, sold, borrowed, and read picture books of the year. And there's also a Spanish edition for this title available. Next up on the list is a sweet story from debut author Cynthia Harmony. A little girl and her dog embark on their daily walk through the city. They skip and spin to the familiar sounds of revving cars and friendly barks, but what they aren't expecting to hear is the terrifying, terrifying sound of a rumbling earthquake and then silence. Cynthia was inspired by the devastating earthquakes that hit Mexico City in 1985 and 2017. She actually experienced one of these quakes and wanted to write a story that shows the courage and resilience of Mexico City. With captivating text and lively illustrations, this heartwarming story leaves readers with the message that they can choose to be strong and brave even when they're even when they're scared and can, can still find joy and hope in the midst of sadness. Now for my favorite book of the year, Tumble by Celia C. Perez. Celia is an author that we all know and love, and we're so lucky to be publishing her newest book about a 12 year old named Adela Ramirez, who has a big decision to make when her stepfather proposes adoption. Although, although Adela loves her stepfather, she has a million questions. The first being, who's her biological father? And why did he leave when she was a baby? And what would, and would she be able to meet him? This book features a smart protagonist, a peek at a cool subculture, Lucha Libre, and a vibrant ensemble cast. But what I really loved most about this book was Celia's ability to explore feelings that anyone at any range, at any age can connect to. This was such a reassuring and validating read. Next up is Chupa Carter by comedian and actor George Lopez alongside um, Ryan Calejo and illustrated by Santi um, Gutierrez. This start of a series is an illustrated contemporary fantasy starring 12 year old Jorge, who is lonely and hates that he's been sent to live with his grandparents. Everything is going wrong on his first day of, at new school and what Jorge really needs is a friend. And it turns out the only kid who shares his interest in junk food and games is a young chupacabra named Carter. And being friends with a mythical creature should be amazing. But when local cattle turn up dead and his principal starts to suspect the truth, Jorge is torn. Should he trust that his friend is innocent and protect him from exposure or reveal his dangerous existence and change the world forever? And up next, we have the bittersweet story and verse companion to the Puro del Play honor book, They Call Me Guero. They Call Her Fregona um, follows Guero and his budding romance with Joanna Padilla. Um, they call her Fregona because she's tough, always sticking up for others and keeping the school bully in check. But when they start eighth grade, um, Joanna faces a tragedy she's always feared. Her father is detained and deported to Mexico. In the story, Guerrero learns what it means to truly show up for someone you love. David Bowles lovingly captures the emotional complexity of the interior lives of young boys and explores the trauma that undocumented immigrants face every day. The constant fear that your mother, father, sibling, or yourself will be separated from the ones you love. This is a book you won't want to miss. This next book is a collaboration by two creators you might know. Newbery Medal winning author Matt de la Peña and New York Times bestselling critically acclaimed illustrator Karina Lukin. Patchwork explores the infinite possibilities each, each child can paint contains. You could be a dancer, a coder, a basketball player, a poet. You could be any of any and all of these things at every point in your life. This is an uplifting story with gorgeous artwork that tells young readers that your story is still being written. A must-have for every bookshelf. 
In my town, Mi Pueblo, two cousins live in two towns separated by a river. But there's, always, but there's also a bigger divide, the US-Mexico border, which means they live in different countries. On the girl's side, English is the main language, and on the boy's side, it's Spanish. Yet despite living in separate countries with different languages, the children have a world of things in common. This tribute to border towns is written as a bilingual mirror book. Each spread features the same scene on each side of the border, one side in English and one side in Spanish. This allows readers to not only explore the two vibrant cultures, but also introduces them to new vocabulary and develop fluency. This is perfect for Spanish slash English bilingual readers, as well as monolingual kids learning to, looking to learn, learn more. And lastly, we have A Seed in the Sun by Ayeda Salazar. Um, set just a few years after We Were the Fire, this book lives in 1965 and focuses on the rights of migrant workers. Lulu uh, Viramontes wants more than anything to not be invisible, to be a person no one can ignore. She dreams of becoming a daring ringleader in a Mexican traveling circus. But as things become harder in her life from the dangers, uh, from the dangerous working conditions during the grape harvest, to taking care of her mother who has fallen ill, to avoiding her father's volatile temper, Lulu finds that perhaps she needs um, to raise her voice sooner rather than later featuring real life labor rights activists, um, to, like real life labor rights activists like Dolores Huerta, um, this powerful middle grade novel in verse is not one to be missed. And now to wrap us up, I just wanted to quickly mention a few titles that we have coming up um, at the beginning of next year. Hands by Tori Maldonado is a fast paced read that packs a punch about a boy figuring out how to best use his hands to build or to knock down. And this is coming in January. And then the next two are out in April. Felice and the Wailing Woman by Diana Lopez is about a 12, is about the 12 year old daughter of La, La Llorona, Llorona, who vows to free her mother and reverse the curse um, that have plagued the magical town of Tres Leches. And then finally, Doodles from the Boogie Down by Stephanie Rodriguez is a debut graphic novel about a young Dominican girl um, as she navigates middle school, her strict mother, shifting friendships, and her dreams of becoming an artist. And finally, if you're looking for more books by Latinx and Hispanic creators, please check out our book list that you can find at the link listed on screen. We have a wide variety of titles, including front list and back list that span across all ages. And that's it from us today. Here's some info on where you can find us and make sure to check out penguinclassroom.com. We're updating the site constantly with materials for you to use, sneak peeks, videos, and more. Have a great day and enjoy the festival. Bye.